Israel Israel Center. On the eve of Yom HaShoah, it is an honor and a pleasure for us to have invited and that uh, Dr. Gabby Engel accepted our invitation to come and speak his story, or his parents' story, of Yom HaShoah. It was actually uh, a number of months ago on the bus in India. We had many bus rides in India. And one of the lengthy bus rides, Gabby was sharing with me the story of his parents and their, uh, their time in India. I got the story of his parents. Uh, and from Hungary to Auschwitz and to Australia. And it was extremely inspiring to me and to my husband. And my first thought, my husband said it to me just in case I wouldn't have thought of it on my own, was Rifki, you have to bring him to the OU Israel Center and hear the whole story. So we thank you very much for coming. And it should be a zchus and an aliyah for your parents, the Shema. In the Shamos, the messages and the lessons that we will all <coughs> learn today. Thank you very much, Rifki. Good morning, everyone. My name, as Rifki mentioned, is Gabby Engel. My wife Susie and I came on Aliyah from Australia in 1977. And I'm here on this area of Yom HaShoah to tell you a little about my family. Yes, and I said just a little. Now, how did this come about that I'm here? Well, Rifki let him say it, but I'll go over it again. Susie and I had the great fortune to recently travel to India on the only trip of the two Aries. It was an amazing trip, unique, sorry, unforgettable. Yeah. Yes, no, hold okay. the mic, maybe. maybe you could hold the mic or something. I'll try to like this. Is that okay? Yeah. Well, it's better, thank uh, you. Okay. So we had a fantastic time in India, and on one of the trips I happened to be speaking to Rifki, telling her a little bit about my parents' experiences in Auschwitz, and then we came back. She said, well, are you prepared to speak about it at the OU? Well, I've never done anything like this before, but uh, you know, if he asks, you agree. <laughs> now, I'm not a particularly emotional person, but it is a very emotional topic. And please excuse me, but I'll be reading most of it, not, not looking. Now, when I saw the ad in the Torah Tidbits, which mentioned my parents' heroic story, I was a little taken aback and embarrassed because Growing up in Australia, all my friends had the same backgrounds. All their parents came from Auschwitz. Yeah. Yeah. Where in Australia? I'm from Sydney. Sydney. The Hungarians and Germans went mostly to Sydney, to Poles. And... Sure. Okay. Yeah, I remember. Went to Shul, same Shul as your father. My Machutten. Your okay. <laughs> so. Heroic story. None of us ever saw their stories as heroic. I mean, we didn't know much about it. We never thought about it. We were just kids growing up. But I'm thinking about it. I came to the conclusion that yes, they were heroes. I think anybody who managed to survive the Holocaust, raise a family, and live some sort of semblance of a normal life, I think they really are heroes. Now, I'm going to separate my mother's and father's story initially, talk briefly about their lives before the war, and I may jump from period, time period to time period, so please just bear with me. And instead of using the term Holocaust, as a general term, I will be using Auschwitz because that's the term I grew up with. I'll start with my father, Zichron Livracha. I only know a little about his personal history, when I could have asked, I didn't. When I wanted to, it was too late. My father was born in a town called Serench in Hungary, passed away here in Israel when he was 96 years old. He was born into a wealthy family in the wine-growing Tokai region in Hungary. They had a Yekev winery. They manufactured wine for local, local and for export to various other Hungarian countries, uh, sorry, other European countries, I think about them. This was a family business going back generations, and in fact, my only uncle on my father's side who survived, that's his older brother Yosef, he told me that he once found a contract amongst the papers, a contract going back a couple of hundred years between some Hungarian baron who had sold so many acres of grapes to the Jew Engel. My uncle Yosef, he was the Ye Nun, the wine expert in the family, and my father and another brother, they were on the business side. 
In fact, when my uncle Yosef managed to get to Israel after the war, he had the same job as wine expert in two well-known wineries here in Israel. My father was one of seven children, three boys, four girls. He was the youngest of the boys. My uncle Yosef was the oldest. The middle brother, Shmuel, <coughs> it seems he was quite a tough guy. When he was in his teens, some local anti-Semitic hoodlums attacked him, and he beat them up so badly they all had to be put in hospital. <laughs> So the family had to smuggle him out of town because the police were looking for him. All of my father's siblings and their families and his parents, everybody but his oldest brother, Yosef, perished in Auschwitz. My father was a quiet man with a quiet sense of humor. He was a Talmud Chacham who had learned for many years in some of the talk yeshivot in Hungary. He loved learning, and I always remember him sitting and learning when he wasn't working. Now, my father limped. This was because on one of his travels, by horse and carriage in those days, the carriage overturned and he broke his leg very badly. It healed in a way that the knee joint fused, and from then on, he couldn't bend that leg. Now, I don't know for sure whether he was in Auschwitz. He told me that he was in a camp called Kittlitztreben, which I understand was a satellite camp of Grossrosen. However, from other things he said, I got the impression that he was in Auschwitz first. He didn't have a number, as many of them did not get numbers before they were transferred. As I mentioned before, he was a quiet man, and he never spoke about what happened to him in the camps. What I do know, and it's little, I found out from the few family members who survived. My father was married at the time and had children, either two or three, I don't know. I never asked him. His wife and children were murdered in Auschwitz, and I only recently found out the names of two of the children. One of our neighbors, also a survivor of Auschwitz from Hungary, he attempted to go to visit Budapest every year on holidays, and it seems a few years ago the Hungarian government established a Holocaust museum in Budapest with the names of all those who had perished. So he went there, and sure enough, he found there the name of my father's first wife and two of the children. Uh, after the war, my, he, my father married my mother, who was in fact a second cousin of his first wife. Now one day in the camps, it was either Rosh Hashanah or Yom Kippur, I'm not sure, the men were out working in the forest, and when the Nazi guards weren't looking, they took it in turn to hide behind a tree, a bush, or whatever, and to mumble a few words of the tefillot that they remembered by heart. Of course, they didn't have Sidurim or Machzorim. My father's misfortune, when it was his turn, the Nazi guard caught him Daphne, and he slammed a pick into his bad knee. He went to the infirmary, where a Jewish male nurse bandaged his knee, but said, you have to get straight back to work, as anybody who stayed in the infirmary for three days was taken straight, straight to the gas chambers. For the next 20 years or so, my father had osteomyelitis of the knee, with pus constantly coming out of the fistula. He had to treat this every day and bandage it every day for nearly 20 years. He had the knee operated on in Australia three times. The first two times unsuccessfully, but in the third operation, they managed to remove a piece of metal, which apparently was part of the pick with which the Nazi had hit his leg. This piece of metal, the doctor said, was the focus, the cause of the constant infection. After this, the leg healed, and he still limped, of course, but there was no pus and no need to bandage. Now, I don't know what he did in the camps, but when I was sitting shiver for him, uh, many people came, and a few of them came from Nikumavelim, and he told me that my father had saved their lives during the war. I didn't know these people, and I've never seen them again. And to my great regret, I didn't ask them for details. I'm an only child, there were loads of people coming, and I was just overwhelmed. And I'll regret it always that I've never asked them, what actually did he do? How did he save you? I know from one of my very few cousins who survived that my father had a nephew with him in the camps. This was a young child, and my father looked after him until just a few days before the liberation when the Nazis took the child and killed him. 
After the liberation, my father went back to his town, Serenge. Most survivors went back to their towns of origin to see who would survive. <coughs> now, there were many people in Serenge who arrived and there was nobody left. So my father took all these people in. It seems they had a large estate with a central courtyard and many apartments all around. He took all these people in, he clothed them, fed them, worked for them, and looked after them until they managed to get back on their own two feet. In 1946, he married my mother, and I was born in 1947. Of course, the Nazis had destroyed the winery, taken everything, so he started working from scratch. Now, he was a talented businessman, uh, but then the communists took over, so my parents had to leave, or decided to leave. So my father bribed the border guards, and we crossed into Austria. Of course, they, they could only take what they had on them. They couldn't take anything else, so we arrived in Vienna with nothing. For that reason, I have no photos, no pictures of grandparents or uncles or aunts or cousins, nothing. My parents wanted to come on Aliyah, uh, especially my father, as his one remaining sibling, his older brother, had managed to get to Israel. So they managed to scrape together some money. They organized a small lift, which they sent to Israel. Then in Vienna, my father met a fellow Jew who owed him a large sum of money from before the war. When my father asked him for the money, he said he didn't have it on him, but that he was on the way to Australia, and that if we would also go to Australia, he would give him the money there. So, uh, as we had nothing, plans changed, and that's how we got to Australia. <laughs> Needless to say, the money was never in pay. My mother was born in 1918 in a small town close to the town of uh, Nogselish, and she died here in Yerushalayim at the age of 89. She was one of six siblings, five girls, one boy. She was the daughter of a Rav, and she, in fact, was the great-great-granddaughter of a very well-known Hungarian Rav, Rav Schmuel Klein. She comes from a Shalshelet of Rabbanim. Now, as with my father, she never spoke about what she went through in Auschwitz, and here it actually was Auschwitz. What I do know is from the few family members who were with her and who survived. She was taken to Auschwitz in the cattle trucks with her elderly parents and two young sisters. I don't know what happened to the other siblings, although some of whom did survive. My mother survived Auschwitz physically, but it left many emotional and psychological scars. She never told me what happened to her there, but she mentioned Auschwitz nearly every day of her life, in some context or other. This is like before Auschwitz, this is like after Auschwitz. Auschwitz is always mentioned as when I was growing up. In Auschwitz, her feet became totally deformed, as they gave her shoes that were too small and didn't fit. Now, every morning there was roll call where all the prisoners had to stand for hours at a time, and they, there was a selection made as to who was going to go to the gas chambers and who not. Now, standing there in the winter for hours at a time, in the snow and ice, in these shoes that were too small, they just destroyed her feet totally. And from then on, she always had pain walking and she could never wear normal shoes. She had foot surgery once, but it was unsuccessful. And for her last years, she was bedridden as she couldn't walk at all. She never took any money from the Germans for what they had done. Now, when we got to Australia, she initially said, you know what, I'm going to try and get some reparations. But in order to do so, it was necessary to go to the German embassy and be examined by a German doctor. So my mother went, but when the doctor began examining her, she just got up and ran out. And she said she couldn't stand it as the doctor reminded her of Mengele in Russia. A few years before she died, she decided that, you know what, the whole zot, she's going to try and get some money from them. So I filled in all the necessary forms, sent them off, sent them off, received a notification that they had received the forms, but of course, both the Germans and Hungarians managed to get out of paying anything. As I mentioned, I know some of what happened in Auschwitz from others that she never spoke about it. She was there with three cousins, and some of the information is from them. I do know that they tried to kill her three, on three separate occasions in Auschwitz. 
Every morning there was this roll call, this uphill, where all the prisoners were lined up, and the campos would examine all of them, and they would see who could work and who could not. Those who could not work anymore were sent straight to the gas chambers. <coughs> My mother's feet were in such a bad state that she couldn't work. And so, the first time, the capo pulled her out. Somehow or other, my mother found the wherewithal, punched her, and just ran back into the crowd. The next time, again, the capo pulled her out because she couldn't work. This time, her three cousins who were with her pulled her back, and again, she hid in the crowd. The third time, the capo was successful, and she was taken to the gas chambers. Outside the gas chambers, there was a huge pile of clothes outside the door to the gas chambers. And when the Nazi guard wasn't looking, she jumped into the pile of clothes, burrowed into them, and hid there. And the others were taken in and murdered. Once it was over, she came out. One of the guards saw her and beat her savagely, but you know, German efficiency, it seems it wasn't worth it to start the whole procedure again for one person, so she was sent back to the barracks. As I mentioned, all of the above I heard from others. However, a couple of days before she passed away, I was sitting with her and she pointed to the t-shirt that her caregiver was wearing. On the t-shirt was a picture of a dog. And she said to me, did you know that Mangala's dog saved my life? I said, mommy, I have no idea what you're talking about. So she told me that when they got off the infamous cattle trucks at Auschwitz, she was with her elderly parents, two little sisters. They stood in line in front of the ramp where Mengele Marchimel sat, and he would decide with a flick of his fingers to the gas chambers or to work and possibly live. Anyway, as they were standing in line, all of a sudden Mengele's dog left Mengele and comes and sits down next to my mother. My mother never had a dog, she was the daughter of a rabbit, never had anything to do with dogs, even though in Australia we did get a dog. <coughs> As the line progressed, the dog went with her. When she stopped, he stopped. When she went, he went. Now, I presume this dog wasn't a cocker spaniel, but some sort of vicious Alsatian or Doberman, I have no idea. When they reached Mangala, he looked at her old parents and flipped his finger to the gas chambers. The two little sisters, gas chambers. He looked at my mother, and then he said, oh, I see my dog likes you. Very well, you go to the other side. <laughs> and that's how my mother was saved. Now, just, <clears throat> just to complete my mother's Auschwitz saga, I'll go back about five years or so. Now, nearly all of my family on both sides was wiped out, but I do have a beloved cousin in Petr Tikva who was a teenager in Auschwitz. For the last eight to ten years, he has been going with the Yeshiva Tichonit as an Ish Edut. And about five years ago, he told me that the Yeshiva had asked him again to go with him, with them, but his wife was worried as he wasn't all that young anymore, and uh, he was well into his 80s. Now, I made a personal commitment, not a matter, that my feet would never step foot on the accursed land of Hungary, Germany, or Poland. But I heard in his voice that he really wanted to go. And he saw Mamasha Shlichut in there, so I said to him, you know what, I'll go with you and I'll look after you. In the end, I was very pleased that I went, as I got something very positive out of it. As we all stood at Mengele's infamous ramp, the Rosh Yeshiva, whose parents were also Auschwitz graduates, as were the parents of one of the accompanying fathers. The Rosh Hashiva said, okay, now the three of us are going to say the bracha, and then we will say it, b'shem v'malchut. And we did. And this really affected me greatly. He then asked me to tell the boys the story of uh, my mother and Mengele's dog. Now, I'm not all that emotional, but after telling the story to that boys in that place, in that accursed place, I really broke down and lost it. And it was a sort of a catharsis. Now, while in Auschwitz, I went to the office, filled in a form with my mother's name, her number, and my home address. And sure enough, a few weeks later, I get a letter with all my mother's details, which transport she came on, what date, um, the date she received her tattoo. They were very meticulous. And also, to my amazement, 
the date that she was transferred to Buchenwald. Now, I never knew that my mother was in Buchenwald. She never mentioned Buchenwald, only Auschwitz. So as to what happened to her in Buchenwald, I have no idea. The final note about my mother in Auschwitz that I know of is that when we got to Sydney, Australia, it was the first day of garden, kindergarten. I guess I must have been about three years old. There was only one Jewish kindergarten in Sydney at the time. And uh, all the mothers, or most of the mothers who had brought the children there, were all Auschwitz graduates. They look around, and what do they see? Lo and behold, there is one of the capos who's also bringing her child to kindergarten. One of the capos, the Jewish capo, she also was bringing her child to kindergarten. I found out in later years that there was talk of killing the woman, but of course they didn't, and she became a very accepted member of the Jewish community. Now, we arrived in Australia in 1949 or 1950. We arrived with nothing. The man who owed my father the money refused to pay, and my father had to find some work. His, his first job was on the packaging line of a chocolate factory. But winter came, early Shabbat, okay, no job. He then found a job as a clerk in the taxation department. Now, my father couldn't read or speak English yet, so how he got the job, I have no idea. <laughs> but none of us he knew. Anyway, the same problem. Winter, early Shabbat, no job. During this period, my mother worked till all hours of the night sewing belts for dresses. My father then tried two unsuccessful partnerships with Jewish partners. They didn't work out. Finally, he opened a wine and spirits business, retail, wholesale and manufacturing with a non-Jewish partner, a Hungarian he used to do business with in the old days. This was a successful partnership for many, many years until my parents came on Aliyah, prior to which the business was sold. Now, growing up in Australia, nearly all of my chevra, all of my friends, perhaps 99%, were from similar backgrounds. In other words, second generation. And we had a wonderful childhood. You know, we went to school, we went to Bnei Akiva, went to the beach every day. It was great. Now, we were all religious. And we thought that all religious Jews spoke English with these European accents, as did our parents. If you don't speak like that, you can't be religious. My eyes were open to this, on this aspect, when I first went to London. The person I was staying with on Shabbat took me to Davin in a Hasidic shtil. My host and I were the only ones there with our Bekesha and Shreinu. All of a sudden, I heard somebody speaking English, but this was the Queen's English, with what we Australians used to call a very posh accent. I'm looking around and all I see is Bekeshas and Shreinu's everywhere. So I asked my hope, uh, my host, are there some non-Jews here as well? <laughs> are there some non-Jews? I didn't realize that there were religious people who could speak real English. <laughs> my friends and I never realized what Monsieur Nefesh our parents had, whether it was losing jobs for Shabbat, etc. We just lived our happy childhoods all in the same boat. We, everything was the same. We didn't really know or realize that there are other people of our age who had extended families with grandparents and uncles and aunts and cousins and... I mean, when our children got married here in Israel, they married, thank God, into families who had not gone through it. So our children-in-law had 20, 30, 40 first cousins. I mean, this was totally foreign to us. It was wonderful. However, we were all very good kids. We all did what our parents said, we were very obedient, and we, on the whole, we never really made waves with our parents. Was this because we were second generation? Maybe, perhaps, I don't know. Now, I never realized what great Monsieur Nefesh my parents in particular had until I became a parent myself. In Sydney, they started a Jewish primary school. My friends and I were in the first class. This was Mariah College. After school, a few of us would go to Cheder for Hollywood in college. In addition, my father thought this wasn't enough, and I always had private Gomorrah lessons with whichever Rav came from Israel for a couple of years. <coughs> then when I was about 15 years old, in a regular high school, as there were no Jewish high schools, in the, there came a time when there was no Rav to learn with. So my father said, okay, 
have to go to Israel. So I came, my parents sent me to Israel for about two years to learn in a yeshiva tichonit. I came to learn in yeshiva tichonit. For those two years, I didn't see my father. My mother came to visit once. There were no telephones, and the only means of communication were aerograms and letters. In those days, it wasn't yet fashionable, at least from Australia, to send boys to yeshiva after high school. And here I was at the age of 15, an only child of Holocaust survivors. They sent me thousands of miles away for two years to learn Torah. At the time, I never realized how much Masil Nefesh was involved in their decision. My parents came on Aliyah in 1985. As I mentioned previously, my father loved learning, so when they came on Aliyah, he went to Kailal Balabatim every day. This is apart from learning at home, by himself. He said her yom was as follows. Shul in the morning, breakfast, the on the bus to Shul Machri, Yehuda for shopping, and then home for lunch, rest, and the rest of the day, till the evening in Kailal. During this time, my mother was housebound because of her feet. My father continued the Abbas Seder until the age of 93, when he got Alzheimer's, which got pro progressively worse, and he passed away at the age of 96. He was a very clever, generous man with Chochmat Chaim, and was loved and, linked and liked by all who met him. I'll just go back now, quite a few years, for an incident that happened. My parents, my uncle Yosef, who was a widow at the time, and my family, that Susie and whichever kids we had at the time, we went to the hotel in Netanya Galitzans for Pesach. Um, now, uh, for those who know or don't know, this is a, it's mostly Hasidish. Everybody, well, most people who go to this hotel at the time, at least, were Hasidish. Um, I was probably the only kippah suge out there, apart from the waiters. And so every time I went into the Federal, bring me a this, bring me a that. <laughs> so one day I was sitting in the lobby with my father and my uncle, when a chosid of roughly the similar age, with Bekish Estrabel, walks past us. So my father or uncle, I can't remember which, says to the other, hey, isn't that so-and-so? So the other one looks and says, yes, I think you're right, that is. So they said to him, Shalom Aleichem wrote so-and-so. The man got very flustered. He said, no, that's not me, you've got the wrong person, and he ran off. Okay. So I asked my uncle, what's the story? I asked my uncle because my father never spoke about what happened in the war. So he said that the man was a Polish Jew with whom they did business before the war. Now, as we all know, the Germans invaded Poland well before they got into Hungary. So one day, my father got a message, a telegram, a letter in the office saying, the Nazis are coming, Laman Hashem, save us. So my father organized transport, bribed border guards, and managed to get the whole family out of Poland into Hungary from where they went on. Next thing we heard about an hour or two later is that the Jew had had a heart attack and was taken to hospital. As to what happened there further, I have no idea. And one can only surmise about any possible connection. Did he think that my Father wanted money back for all the huge expense that he had laid out to save him? Maybe, I don't know, but he certainly, my father certainly didn't want it. They were just happy to see that the man had survived with his family. I will just finish with a short story that I believe epitomizes my father. A few years before he passed away, we were walking together to Shul, and I wanted to ask him if he had any complaints, ta'anot, to a Baruch Hu. But I didn't want to use the word ta'anot. So I asked him instead if he had any questions. And he said, look to Akkurj Baruch Hu. So my father answered with a question. Questions about what? I said, questions about bad things that happened to you during your life. He answered with another question. What bad things happened to me during my life? I didn't want to say they murdered your wife, your children, your parents, almost all of your family. They ruined your knee. You had to start life again from scratch three times. So instead, I just said, well, bad things like Auschwitz, for example. So he answered with something I'll never forget. He said, my son, Auschwitz was a terrible thing for Israel, 
For me personally, I can't respond when nobody did anything bad. I was left speechless. I didn't know what to say. I can only hope that I can achieve a fraction of the emunah that my father had. And I pray that my parents, the Chronan Livracha, and all our murdered brethren, Hashem Yikom Tamam, should be made to say Yosher for all of us in Klan Israel. <laughs>